The last two evidentiary objections that I'm going to highlight, objection improper impeachment and objection improper opinion, uh, both concern witnesses. So obviously mock trial, each side's going to have their respective witnesses. And these are just things to patrol, look out for as you're the opponent. Again, the one charged with objecting at trial, you're sitting there. Uh, what are you looking for as far as uh, we talked about? You're looking for extraneous stuff like it's irrelevant. You're looking for things that are too far out of bounds that inflame the passions of the jury, like objection unfairly prejudicial. You're certainly looking for through this witness, we're trying to drag in quote bubbles and statements for the content to prove that truth of that content with the, the words that are in quotes with objection hearsay. Um, and of course, you're looking for, uh, are we just talking sort of bad stuff about people, especially characters in the play, like the criminal defendant, the victim, parties in a civil case, uh, offered for propensity. We're trying to show that they were once a bad person, so now they're a bad person, so there's why one side should prevail or not, objection, improper character. These last two really focus on witnesses and what we're allowed to do with witnesses. I have to d disclose up front, objection, improper impeachment is a difficult one to get your head around because it's a differently framed objection. I want you to think about it this way. One of the things we do, especially on cross-examination, one of the things we do as attorneys is we try to impeach. And what that means is we're trying to ask questions or we try to get into testimony designed to uh, impact the credibility of the witness. That is, we're trying to have some form of maybe jury, maybe uh, evaluators at mock trial. You shouldn't believe what this witness has to say. So it's something short of calling them an outright liar. Uh, you're not going to do that, but you're going to ask questions and you're going to explore topics as to why their testimony, this witness's testimony, a testimony of a witness from the other side that was called from the other side in direct examination, why you on cross-examination most likely are trying to do some things to get at their credibility, to have arguments available to you in closing uh, argument that you can say, yeah, this witness said the light was green. Well, eyewitnesses said the light was red, but let's look at all the credibility problems of that witness. Let's look at some of the reasons why you may not believe all that that witness is going to say. And there are acceptable ways that you're entitled to impeach a witness. I can't without any basis just say, I think you're a liar. And so therefore, jury, you should think this person's a liar. That's not an acceptable form of impeachment. You're not able to make credibility arguments just because you think the person's not telling the truth. So therefore, you want to argue to the jury that they shouldn't think so. There are a couple of things that you can explore. There are these vehicles that you can take to go down the road of impeachment, to go down the road of exploring the witness's credibility. And if you're not on one of those pathways, if you're not using one of those vehicles, uh, the other side can object and they can object and say objection, improper impeachment. So let's talk about what the vehicles are, what you're allowed to do as the proponent, as the one on cross-examination, the one up presenting, the one putting on evidence. And therefore you can be ready for when someone's not doing one of those acceptable things. Here are some of your impeachment vehicles. Here's the stuff you can kind of get at. So of course, any witnesses that are up there, I can go into their memory. You know, uh, this event happened 20 years ago and you've had some things happen in those 20 years. Are you sure you remember it the way you're telling it today? I can ask questions about the accuracy of someone's memory. Maybe 20 years ago when they saw the thing or they were a precipient witness to the event and they gave a statement, uh, they said specific things. The person was wearing a green and yellow shirt. Here 20 years later at trial, they say it's a red and blue shirt. I can explore the memory. I can, uh, I can go into the memory uh, and try to show, well, you know, this person's not an outright liar but their memory is challenged. We should question their credibility. We should question some of their testimony. I can argue uh, that we should uh, doubt some of their testimony because they have this impaired memory. I can certainly explore that. The same thing with uh, impaired perception at the time. Uh, you know, this is again in my cousin Vinny, were you wearing your prescription eyeglasses? I can go into the fact, were you able to perceive the events 
at the time, not whether you're able to remember them now uh, from back then, but were you able to perceive on the day of the event? Was there something in the way? These are these questions in car accident cases of what was the weather like? What was your visibility like? Where were you standing? What was in the way? How were you obstructed? I can explore and I'm allowed to explore because it goes to credibility, which is always at issue with every witness. As soon as you raise your hand, as soon as you take an oath, your credibility is an issue. I can go into that witness's memory. I can go into that witness's perception. And a big one is I can go into bias. If I'm testifying for uh, a criminal defendant and I'm the criminal defendant's brother, you're entitled to ask that question. Aren't you in fact related to the criminal defendant? Or didn't you grow up with him? Uh, wouldn't you want to do anything and say anything to make sure that he doesn't get in trouble here today? Those types of questions that we see from TV and the movies, they're allowed to ask them. They're allowed to get into it because it's one of the acceptable pathways, one of the acceptable vehicles to, to, uh, to go after credibility, to try to impeach a witness. You see it with expert witnesses sometimes, which do show up in mock trial, where you might say, how many times do you testify for just plaintiffs? Uh, how much are you paid for this? Well, that goes into maybe you're paid a lot, so that's why you testify always for plaintiffs, and so it goes into bias. I can explore questions. It doesn't mean it's gonna work out for me as the, as the questioner. They may have good answers about their memory, about their perception, about their bias, but I can, ask questions along those directions. You say objection irrelevant or objection improper, uh, improper impeachment. As the proponent, I would disengage from the cross-examination. I turn to the court, I would talk through the court, and I would say, this is not improper impeachment. This goes to bias. This is not improper impeachment, Your Honor. This goes to perception. This is not improper impeachment, Your Honor. This goes to the witness's memory. Objection overruled, you'll be able to move on and resume your questioning. Two other things that come up that are more based in the rules, the first three are not as based in the rules, is to demonstrate inconsistencies. So I talked about before when I was talking about memory, about that green and yellow shirt versus him saying it's a red and blue shirt today. Well, I can explore that he said different things on different days. Uh, I, can, I can explore that there's this inconsistency and I can argue that inconsistency later on. Why? To say, this is a person who may have bad memory. This is a person who uh, we might not be able to believe. They have credibility problems because they have these inconsistencies. Uh, and that's in several of the rules that I'm able to do that. So even if it's a minor thing, like the color of a shirt and the color of a shirt's not all that important, uh, I still get to get into inconsistencies and in testimonies, especially from prior statements, because you can, I can make a credibility argument. This is a person that can't remember what time of day it was. This is a person that can't remember what color the car was in the car accident. How can we really trust them as to the color of the light and whose fault it is? Those types of credibility arguments I'm allowed to do at trial on cross-examination. And the last one is probably the it's the one based in the rules. It's the least effective where I can actually ask questions about whether uh, a, another witness has an opinion about a witness who testified or knows that witness's reputation for being untruthful. Really ineffective testimony, but it's, uh, but it's one of the vehicles uh, under. So you can see these are not really based in the rules, these couple, and these are based in the rules over here. A big one that comes up, of course, for attacking truthfulness is prior convictions of witnesses. It has a whole rule devoted to it in the federal rules, rule 609. And sometimes you're allowed to get into the witness's prior conviction, and sometimes you're not allowed to get into the witness's prior conviction. It's a whole separate class that we would have on that. But notice it's convictions. So if it's just bad stuff about a witness, uh, you've been in trouble a lot. Uh, weren't you arrested last Thursday? Uh, haven't you been, um, uh, you know, told by the police to stop doing what you're doing on several occasions. Well, those are the type of things. They don't rise to the level of convictions. Maybe an arrest, maybe told by the police to stop doing what they're doing, doesn't fit one of these uh, impeachment vehicles. So the way I want you to think about it is, you can say on cross-examination, objection, improper impeachment, if you think essentially that the proponent on cross-examination is not on one of these paths. If they're not exploring an inconsistency, if they're not trying to go to bias, if they're not exploring memory or perception, if they're not going into specific acts of untruthfulness or, or convictions, you can say objection, improper impeachment, and then make them, make the proponent disengage from cross-examination, turn to the court, talk to the court and say, 
I am allowed to do this is proper impeachment because I'm doing, and they'd have to name one of these uh, vehicles. It's it's very seldom happens uh, in mock trial. Very seldom happens at trial where we have this type of uh, objection that comes up under Article Six and some of these uh, that come from the common law that are not in the rules. But you gotta look to say why are they entitled to ask this question? What are they entitled to get at? Uh, if I just want to um, ask a witness in trial that that saw the car accident on July 23rd, and I want to start asking him about his prior relationships and doesn't he um, has he uh, failed in these prior relationships with uh, many different people? I, I just think it's uh, one of those things that makes him not look too good. So I'm just going to start asking questions. And then you had another relationship with a different person in the year after. And that one didn't work out either. Well, it sounds like cross-examination. It sounds like something uh, that you hear in TV and the movies. The problem is failed relationships. Tell me where that fits. Objection, improper impeachment. You don't just get to go into it because it's in the file. It has to go to memory, perception, bias, inconsistencies, or some type of attack on uh, the person's character for truthfulness. And you could be as truthful as anything and not be able to have successful relationships. Um, you can have uh, um, might not have successful relationships, but it doesn't say anything about your ability to perceive events at the time or remember events at trial that were 20 years ago. So. Think about these vehicles. Think about them in designing your own cross-examinations. You want to stay in these pockets. You're always able to uh, talk about relevant things in cross-examination, um, including favorable facts that are in the fact pattern. So you can ask things that favor you. But if you're going to go down a road and saying, now I'm going to go into a different block of cross-examination that just has to do with the witness's credibility. I want to talk about their prior convictions. I want to talk about some potential inconsistencies. I want to talk about their bias as an expert witness that's paid for their time. I want to talk about the, uh, the fact that they weren't wearing prescription eyeglasses at the time of the accident. I want to talk about the fact that uh, between the incident 20 years ago in their testimony at trial, they took a two by four to the head and can't remember things. I, I'm allowed to cross-examine about these things. So make sure you know why you're asking questions in cross-examination. If it's to go to credibility, it's got to be on one of these paths. If not, as the proponent on cross-examination, the one presenting, the one putting on evidence, you might be susceptible to an improper impeachment objection. Okay, the last one that we'll talk about is objection improper opinion. I included this one and I elevated this one as one of the ones that you should, uh, evidentiary objections that you should consider under Article 7, uh, because lots of mock trial fact patterns have um, uh, expert witnesses, and a lot of them have um, law enforcement and sort of hybrid um, hybrid witnesses that are not just lay witnesses. They, they have some specialized knowledge, some expertise. Uh, so think about it in this way. There's really two types of witnesses that as it relates to this evidentiary objection, as it relates to Article 7, and that is there are lay witnesses. These are folks that have some personal knowledge of something at issue in the case. So if in our car accident example on July 23rd, this would be a person standing on the corner that just happened to observe it. Why do they become a witness? It's because they were able to perceive something at the time. They have personal knowledge of the events of the case. So I can ask them about, you know, the things they saw, the things they perceived, the weather conditions at the time, what car did they see, what color was the light, uh, what did they see immediately thereafter, so on and so forth. I'm calling them as a lay witness. Now, if I tried to use that witness to do more than that, if I tried to pretend that that witness had some type of specialized knowledge or some type of expertise, and I started asking their opinion about things, well, that opinion might be improper. Who do you think was at fault? Um, do you think the driver was uh, in the white van was driving in a safe and reasonable manner uh, consistent with uh, the vehicle code of the state? Th those are might be calling for specialized knowledge that that person on the corner doesn't have. So you can object and say objection, improper opinion. Don't solicit an opinion from a lay person unless it's something that any one of us would have been able to offer at the time. Um, yeah. So so look out for it if you have a late witness that they're trying to get more from, that they're trying to get uh, based on the tire tracks on the side of the road, how long, uh, how fast was the person going? Well, that calls for some type of special, specialized knowledge. That's usually a tire tread expert. That's usually some type of forensic expert. You can't make a lay witness 
into a forensic expert and start asking their opinions about who was right and who was wrong and how fast people were going. You can say, uh, you can ask questions that any one of us, if we were standing on that corner, would be able to answer. That, you know, uh, did it, did the person appear to notice that the light was changing based on what you saw? No, they were, they were proceeding at the same rate of speed all the way through. Uh, that's more than an opinion, that's an observation. So you might be able to get away with it. On the flip side, expert witnesses are witnesses that didn't see anything, have no personal knowledge for the most part. They're called and enlisted and hired into cases because they have some specialized knowledge. And instead of being on the corner and seeing the accident like a lay witness, uh, we hire them. So we hire the accident reconstructionists. We hire the, the tire tread expert. We hire um, uh, medical experts to do uh, independent medical exams and tell us what's wrong with the people that were injured in the accident. They look at all the material, they, they conduct their own tests and they formulate their own reports and opinions, and they're entitled under the rules under Article 7 to come in and offer those opinions. So we got to make sure that they stay within the bounds of what is their area of expertise? What are the types of opinions that they can offer in this case? If it's a medical expert, they shouldn't be doing the things that an accident reconstructionist would normally do. If they're an accident reconstructionist, they shouldn't be talking about prognosis and diagnosis and uh, what's happening medically with the people. So it's really a way, again, that in mock trial that you would patrol the perimeters of the, and it doesn't matter that it's in the file. It doesn't matter that it's in the report. You make your own independent decision as an attorney or playing an attorney in a mock trial, what is proper. And if it's a lay, a lay witness, you're trying to say the proper opinions that a lay witness could offer are those that any of us could offer sitting on the side of the road. It's really what did they perceive? What are the facts? What did they see? What would any of us have seen if we were in their shoes on that corner? For an expert witness, you want to go through their background. You want to go through their education. You want to go through everything that contributes to their expertise to demonstrate that, yeah, they weren't there, but they're called to offer this expertise, to offer this field, to offer this specialized knowledge to the jury and actually give opinions that are within the four corners of that specialization. But oftentimes, uh, both of these witnesses in the mock trial file, they will stretch and pull and ask them to do more. And what they're hoping is the mock trial presenters at trial, like it, like it was in the file, will try to present more and will kind of mirror the fact pattern. Well, you as the opponent should be objection improper opinion. As a late witness, they're not entitled to do that. As an expert witness in the field of uh, forensic pathology, they should not be talking about um, an underlying cancer diagnosis. You know, whatever whatever the objection is and whatever they're trying to stretch and do more than they're entitled to. So here you see it, objection, improper opinion. And sometimes it's this witness is not qualified to offer opinions at all. That might be the lay witness who just saw something on the corner. They shouldn't be offering too many opinions too many opinions, especially opinions that sound like something that would come from someone with specialized knowledge, or it's this witness can't provide this opinion. You know, who's ultimately at fault? Who, um, what was the intent of the, uh, of the driver? Uh, what was the intent of the criminal defendant when he entered the store and you're the storekeeper? Well, you can't offer an expert opinion of what was going on in someone else's head. And there's a rule that, that gets into that. So the objection and proper opinion usually means this witness isn't qualified to offer opinions at all, or this witness can't provide that particular opinion that they're trying to get at. And again, it doesn't matter that it's in the file you're governed by the rules uh, when you go to trial. And here's the proponent's response and just think about it. I'm not offering an improper opinion or this is proper because, or this witness is permitted to offer this opinion because. So I would be saying, well, this person is a forensic pathologist. They can talk about causes of death. Uh, during the course of the autopsy, they realized there was cancer in the system and they have to speak to that because it's part of their expert report and it's part of the opinions that they're qualified to bring into this court. As the proponent, I disengage from my direct examination of the expert witness, the one that I called. I turn not to my opponent, but I turn to the court. I talk through the court. Your Honor, this is not an improper opinion because uh, this person can offer opinions and this opinion is within the bounds of what they're able to do in their specialty. So look out as it relates to witnesses, look out on cross-examination that we're getting at credibility and we're trying to impeach people in the right way. 
and for direct examination, particularly those where it's well, files that have expert witnesses or law enforcement witnesses or some hybrid, a little bit of lay witness, a little bit of um, specialized knowledge and make sure that we're patrolling them with objection, improper impeachment on cross-examination and objection, improper opinion for some of these uh, expert witnesses or lay witnesses. Make sure they stay in the box for which they were offered. Here are the credits as usual.